Hello and welcome to Real Magic Review. My name is Steve Faulkner and today we're going to be talking about imposter syndrome. That was a bit weird, wasn't it, doing it like that? Usually I have the, the thing first and then say it and that felt a bit like sort of weird afternoon TV. I didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> but how you doing good Stuart, Gary, nice to see you. Um, it's sunny out there again isn't it and, I, and we're all in here but well we're not all in here, you're not in here with me, lovely as that would be. Uh, but I hope you well before we get on with it um, I would like to say unusually can you please like and subscribe, there you go um, but actually do, it sounds so common now doesn't it, he just sort of just goes over you but if you like the video that'd be great, makes a big difference, hit it, do it now, uh, subscribe and very importantly at the moment uh, when you do subscribe, do the little bell icon and check all the notifications that you get all of them. There won't be many. I don't put loads of notifications on, but um, things are all up in the air at the moment because I might be going to see my parents next week. So I haven't seen them in months. So that's kind of, you know, because lockdown's sort of lifting. So I might have to go down there. So you'll know if the shows aren't happening. This Monday didn't happen because it's bank holiday and I've got his bank holiday, you know, family stuff going on. And oh, yes, it's all, it's all fine. But make sure you do that so you know, so you don't turn up. And check out cardmagiccourse.com. That'd be lovely. Um, that's my online card magic course. Hundreds of videos, live sessions every week that are then uploaded to the course. So it's a great way to learn to hear people talking about card magic and me doing little mini lectures every week. Um, and check that out. That's cardmagiccourse.com. If you want a free spread curl uh, course, a whole course on the best move in card magic, go to cardmagiccourse.com forward slash curl C U L L. That'd be lovely. Right then, so do ask any questions about this or comment or um, and I'll, I'll just explain. Usually Thursdays is the comments on comment section, uh, but because Monday didn't happen and I think this is a, a lot of people ask me about this, about imposter syndrome. I thought I'd do that this week um, and like I said, it's going to get a bit messed around and also uh, I've been doing loads and loads of reviews, which is great because I had loads to get through and I'm starting to catch up now and I want to maybe go down to two or three reviews a week or one or two reviews a week, which is enough for everyone, isn't it? Um, so obviously there isn't as many comments this week, so I only did one, etc. The Axel Heckler Cube, which we'll talk about next week and I'll, I'll be able to compare them. So a lot of people are saying they want to compare the RD360 with um, the the Easy Cube, because they're pretty much the same routine. So that'll be an interesting one. And we'll put it on that camera there, you see. That'd be good, wouldn't it? Or maybe even that one. Imagine that. There's my glasses. Um, and funnily enough, <laughs> I just spent ages. I can't tell you. This is totally unrelated. Um, I couldn't get that. It didn't look right on here. It was really blurry. And I was like, why is it looking so blurry? And I realised, and the monitor's down, I just couldn't, I was really doing my head in it. And then I put my glasses on and went, all right. And clearly what's happening is my eyesight's getting gradually slightly worse. And that used to be very sharp for me. So I'm a bit flustered, as usual. Um, no, Jason, never say you're almost caught up. It just gets calm and now you're ready for more. I know, tell me about it. I shouldn't do that. Okay. Um, this is a big one for me. First of all, I'm going to talk about what imposter syndrome is. I know a lot of people have, but it, if you've not come across it, or maybe you get it, but you don't know what it is, and it's important that we label it. It's, it comes in different guises, but in, imposter syndrome is really that feeling of, oh, do I really deserve to be here? It's, it's that doubt we get of kind of, do I know enough to be doing this thing? So let's take it, you know, with magic. You know, our first gigs or the first time we perform for friends, it's going, am I, you know, I, I look at these people and I see them doing it so flawlessly and I'm really nervous and, and maybe it's because I'm not ready and I shouldn't really be doing this and maybe this, this is for the talented people and the people that find it really easy to do and I'm finding it really difficult so maybe this isn't for me, etc, etc. And it's basically your inner voice, it's your thoughts, which are actually separate from yourself really if we, if we get into all that, but it's your thoughts kind of telling you and putting the doubts in your mind. I get it. I've had it an awful lot in my life with pretty much everything I do. And I think for me, it comes from, you know, growing up in a small town and seeing people like performers and people doing that sort of thing professionally as people that lived in big cities. And it, I'm not putting down as it was lovely, but it was something I always felt other people did. And it, it and it, I didn't really feel worthy of it. So, so I kind of 
you know, I didn't, I can never imagine me doing this sort of thing. I do it every time I do a talk, every time I run a leadership course. I think, you know, am I, do I know enough about this stuff? Am, am I the person? I have had it hugely dealing with like directors of companies feeling really out of my depth. The weird thing is that usually what happens is, well, not at the beginning actually it didn't, but what, what usually happens is after a while you start getting more trust in what you do and those thoughts actually never change, but they just kind of, they change their volume and they change their strength and you learn, well, we go into ways of dealing with it, but you kind of learn to make friends with them and kind of understand that they're just thoughts and then and thoughts aren't really real and you're not really your thoughts they're just stuff that clatter along in the background and we can kind of put them into the background a bit but if you've ever thought you know am i an imp and the old imposter imposter thing of course is going sh should somebody else be doing this am i it's a feeling it's a it's a feeling that someone's gonna and i've always had this someone's gonna tap you on the shoulder and go i've just sussed you out you're actually not very good at this so you? <laughs> you've been winging it and you've been getting away with it and it's that but I've got a theory on it, and I'm sure other people have got similar theories, but I, because I've thought about this a lot, and I've talked an awful lot about this, and it's the sort of thing that when I talk about it in my courses and you know, lectures and things like that, you can see the relief, and people always want me to talk about it. They want, they want to, because it's not just them. All of a sudden, people feel less lonely. They feel like it's not, because it is something that up till recently we didn't really talk about. And that almost kind of exacerbates the problem. It makes the problem worse. So my theory is this. When, you, when we grow up, our culture creates idols of people of fame or people that do things or people that get in front of people or performers. You know, we, we put them on pedestals. We see them in newspapers. We see people that are famous doing normal things and that becomes a story. So even though, even if we don't agree with it consciously or we don't believe it, we see people treated as if they are not human, as if they are more than human. And I remember as a kid seeing, seeing someone on stage, you know, when I was a kid, I used to watch sort of live at the London Palladium and stuff. And they were, I couldn't imagine them being real people. I couldn't imagine meeting these people. They seemed so amazing at what they did. It seemed so far away from anything I was, I could ever do. You know, even when I started doing a tiny little bit of acting in the youth theatre, the idea of doing that as a job was just, was just not really in my mind until a bit later. And we, so we see that and we grow up with it. And even when we sort of grow out and we might think consciously, oh, they're, they're just people, we don't really believe that. Again, we see them in, in, in these super, portrayed as, as more than human, as, as superheroes, really. That's how we treat them as gods. And, what happens is that when we get close to maybe doing a similar thing that we've seen for years those people doing, we don't feel like gods, we don't feel superhuman, we don't feel talented, we don't feel like it's effortless. We feel all those doubts and those insecurities. And when we and they seem so sure, you know, when we see people do it, when, when you see, you know, magicians on TV as a kid, they just seem so sure of themselves. There, there was, you couldn't read any doubt in their performances. It was almost like they were born to do it. And you're going out and doing the same thing. And not all of you, but some of you, if you're like me, are going out and going, what? Actually, I've, I feel really nervous. And I feel like I'm not quite ready for this. And I'm, I'm worried about, you know, I, f I always think I feel a bit like a child in an adult's world is a way of putting it. You know, I, f I feel like I haven't got the authority to do it. But then when I get on stage, and it took me a while to get there, it's weird. All that just goes, and I'm in control, and I do that. And there's a real mismatch between those two things. Now, I'm, and I've come off stage before and, and said to people, God, I was, really, I was really nervous at the beginning. And they think, oh, God, I couldn't see any of that. And that's a classic thing you'll get. You'll, you'll feel nervous inside, and maybe that will, will dissipate or go when you're on stage and you get into the flow. But you'll still feel it before as you walk on stage and... But they, from an audience perspective, they see quite often someone really confident. It's, it's, what you, it's what we practice doing. It's part of the skill of doing it, I suppose. But it just kind of gets easier and easier and easier. So I think for me, that sort of sums it up what it is. And again, you know, there's a thing that I call templating and it's basically stereotyping. And I got this when I started getting into leadership training in business and working with directors of companies. I felt way out of my depth. I knew I had knowledge and I knew I had the stuff to say because I've been trained to say it and I really understood it. 
but I felt out of my depth because again, I'd seen successful business people, directors of companies, portrayed in a certain way growing up. Every movie, every TV show, they were these kind of highly intelligent, kind of clipped, you know, very serious people. And that's what, and even now, you know, I've been working with them for a long time. I, before I meet them, I get this thing in my head and I was working with a load of directors the other day and I still, it was still in there, you know, you could, it's just going to be, it's just going to be a weird one. And then you talk to them, they're just normal people. They're totally normal people. And I know it's a cliche, but they're really normal people. And there's people in incredibly high positions, whether it's performers, directors of companies, people running the town, running the country, council, whatever, that still have those feelings. But of course they don't portray them, so we don't see them, so we don't believe they're there. So when we have those feelings, we go, Ugh. it's it's all a bit weird. So that's what it is. What I also know is that it's incredibly normal. And almost the more responsibility you have, for many of us, the less when we start doing it especially, the less confidence we have in it. But we still find, the, well, many of us still find the strength to do it. And at the beginning I find that strength comes from the importance you've put on it for you, as a human, not as what other people think, but how badly do you want to do that? How badly do you want to be a magician that goes out and feels comfortable and learn to get to that point? And that's the thing that will kind of push you forward. And we will go into other other things in the future and about kind of what how, how do we maintain that motivation when things are tough and I have talked about it before but I've got a few ways of of overcoming it that I've got here the first one and I think the most important which is what I've kind of alluded to already is to acknowledge it and normalize it and understand that we all get it and I know I've kind of said that but actually really sit down and think about that really sit down and think of those people that you have seen all your life in, in whatever context looking ultra confident ultra easy in what they do and just think they are feeling that stuff they might not be when they're doing it when they're on stage when they're in front of the camera or whatever but beforehand they're going to have they're going to have similar feelings but they've just learned to to deal with them look at the evidence this is a this is an important one you know i, I can do 50 decent shows or loads of decent lectures and i do one bad one or one bad thing may happen in one and I walk away and I know that my thoughts, I expect my thoughts are just going to go, are you, should you really be doing this? You know, that was really all over the place. So I did a lecture last week. I, tell you how to I did a lecture, really enjoying myself, really good. Started teaching the cups and balls at the end. I was going through it. I realised I'd run out of time and I was only halfway through the cups and balls teaching it and I just complete, completely lost it. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know. And I just kind of lifted everything was all over the place. And my brain just went into that kind of panic mode and I just kind of went, I don't know where I am here and we're running out of time. So I just went through the rest of the routine really bad, taught it badly, you know, for the last 10 minutes, really badly. And said goodbye and afterwards the difference in when I, the last lecture I did before that with everything, there, there wasn't anything that went really badly or anything, but this one, and it happens, you know, and it, you know, you've got a couple of hours that are fine and then 10 minutes that are bad. The difference of walking away was profound. <laughs> I walked away from one going, oh, I really enjoyed that, and they really enjoyed it, yeah, great. I'm not saying it was perfect, but, you know, for me. And then I walked away from one, really thinking, should I be doing this just because of that 10 minutes at the end? Now, because of, you know, what, like I say, acknowledge it, I know what that is. I know that doesn't mean I shouldn't lecture. It's just how you feel. It's just what your body and brain tricks you into when things don't go perfectly. So part of it is learning how to deal with that. And when I say look at the evidence, I'm look, you look at the evidence and go, well, how many times have I done this well? That didn't go too well but the rest did and that's you're sort of separating your emotions from the actual reality of what happened and sometimes to do that we have to sit down and do it as a, a process not just think about it fleetingly but actually sit down maybe do some journaling around it and I know that's going to be weird for some people but when you get into the habit it's really interesting to do because it kind of it makes you look at it in a more realistic way um, and, and with that you know if something does need work it, because there is the flip side of this that you may get these feelings because there are parts of it you're not that comfortable with and you haven't done many times and that's fine as well. There's nothing wrong with stuff needing work. That doesn't mean you're an imposter and you shouldn't be doing it. And there's nothing wrong with the odd thing not going too well because that happens to everyone and it happens to the most, I don't care what anybody says, the most perfect of us that we see. They all have bad days and they all have shows that don't go too well and that's totally fine. And I think it's you know having people you trust is really important that will tell you that's great but actually that thing needs a bit of work and learning to be 
not thick skinned, but to be resilient enough to take that not as a criticism of you and that you shouldn't be doing it. Because at times your brain and your body, every part of you is going to tell you you should be giving up when things don't go well. It's kind of how it feels. It's the real icky part of what we do. But if you get people just to, you know, or learn to be honest with yourself, you know, watch videos of yourself and we're our own worst critics, but learn that even though certain things may not look right to you, they work well with the audience. Again, look at the evidence. They're laughing at it. They're enjoying it. Okay. They like it. You know, get feedback off the people that book you, ask for really honest feedback. And most of the time, like I say, we beat ourselves up, but we still may need to work on stuff. And if you do need to work on stuff, join the rest of us. There isn't a person I've ever met in my life that doesn't have to work on something, whether it's personally or in their performances. Uh, another thing I do is this thing I call looking across and not up to people. It goes back to the way we tend to idolise people. I think... I don't mean as a lack of respect. I mean, I do look up to people in a way. I think they're amazing and I get inspired by people all the time. But I try not to see them as being up there, you know, up there in this kind of pedestal at the places I can't get. It's kind of like just looking across at them and see them as, as equal. See them as equal people that have maybe done more work than you on that thing or had more experience or been on stage longer or or have something else that you haven't got. And that's fine. But don't see them as superhuman. And I, that's really helped me. A little story. Um, I about ten years ago, I met someone of fame. I was teaching him magic, and uh, I did his birthday party. And I said, "Can I have a quote for my website?" And he said, "Yeah, yeah, fine." And um, but if you teach me some magic tricks. And a couple of days before I was going to go to his house, I don't know what I was expecting. I'd never met someone famous before, uh, you know, that, that was properly famous. And I, and I'm many times. I'm not one of these people that knows loads of famous people in any way. Um, and I well, didn't know what I expected it just to be really different. I expect his life to be different, him to be a different person. And I turned up and it was almost disappointing, the normality of it. <laughs> it was kind of, do you want to come to you? Or, you know, a bit of a, it, there was nothing. And, and actually, of course, that was the best way it could be. But it just again made me realise. And at one point, this thought came into my head and kind of went, have I got the right person here? It, it was absolutely ridiculous. But it really did pop into my head, that thought of, actually, is he that? person it, it was it was unre there was an unreality to it I was so sure that he'd be of a different breed and of course he wasn't and it was completely normal and that was one of those moments I just thought and again working with people that have a lot of responsibility amazing amounts of responsibility that you realize they're just a lot of the time fumbling around like the rest of us because they're human beings so I think that a really important thing for me and a big bigger uh, learning for me um this is, I've talked about this in the last couple of videos that I've done. Strive for perfection. Um, strive for the best you can be, I, I should say, without letting perfection stop you doing what you need to do. And again, it's that same thing of someone mentioned, you know, on Facebook the other day, it's really interesting. You know, would you say, when I was talking about perfectionism and, and, you know, don't get too caught up in it. And someone said, would you say that to Channing Pollock? And I did talk about this last time. I don't want to bang on about it, but it was a really interesting one because, again, you kind of go, well, we see him as perfect, or many of us do, but actually, of course he still had all these imperfections. Of course he still had, the, he might not have in his act, his act might have been, and I'm sure he did, a, you know, we wouldn't have seen him, but I don't care who you are, everybody has the odd rough night, um, for whatever reason. But we, we revere these people, we read all the good stories, we don't, re and we kind of think that they were flawless, and, and we, again, we idolise them, you know, even though we don't explicitly, we're, and we, we have to understand that, especially back in the day, people didn't talk about this stuff. So it didn't really exist. So that's why it's such a revelation even now to talk about it. So I would say, you know, always keep trying to be better, always try to be as perfect as you can. But the minute it stops you because you haven't got the perfect pinky break or they might see that, you know, understand that sometimes you've just got to start. And one of the most important things for me is understanding that I will never feel ready. It's like having kids. Very few people go, right, even though it's they're trying for kids, they don't go, right, it feels like it's going to be easy now having kids. We all know that when that kid comes along and go, we go, oh, I don't know what to do. You know, so, so you never feel ready in that way. You might feel ready, you know, know you want to do it. And the same with performing. You might know you want to do it now. But there are always things that will feel like they need work. And what often happens is, especially when we talk about things or we share, when I share this sort of thing, I only really understand how much I know about it or how much I feel about it when I do it. I don't sit there going, right, I know exactly what I'm going to say. I ain't got a clue what I'm going to say, but I trust the process. And I trust that I've done the, the work beforehand. Um, fake it until you become it, 
All right, Google that. There's a talk uh, on TED where oh, I've got a mental block about who it is. But anyway, she talks about this. Or fake it until you make it is the other one. But, but oh, there is a caveat to this. I don't mean if you haven't got a clue what you're doing, just jump out in front of people and start doing magic tricks if you haven't practiced. But it's that same thing I'm saying. If you don't feel quite ready, you might be more ready than you think about it. And even if you feel like an imposter, learn the techniques to actually look confident, to do what you do. You know, when you go out, learn the little triggers of when you might start to panic. You know, mine, it's when I start talking super quickly. And you'll notice I talk quickly anyway. So I've got to be very careful. I don't start doing this and and I get really lost like I did with the cups and balls the other day and I kind of panic. And you know that. So what I do is I breathe and I think, what do I need to do to look confident now? Okay, I need to breathe. I need to relax. And so I'm I'm not really faking it, but by putting the actions in, even though I might feel different than the actions I'm portraying, what happens is when I start acting like I'm calm, I start becoming calm. So there's this thing about thoughts, emotions and actions being all completely related. So if you're feeling emotionally stressed or emotionally panicked, rather than trying to kind of think your way out of it, which can actually work, but if that doesn't work for you, try and act your way out of it. Try and just act calm, slow down, and all of a sudden it all kind of affects your emotions and will start affecting your thoughts and you'll start thinking more confidently. And there is a lot, quite a lot of neuroscience on what happens to our prefrontal cor- cortex where we when we do kind of panic it kind of goes offline and we have to wait and give it time before it kicks back in again and we can start thinking rationally and communicating rationally so giving that time taking a breath if you are in the middle of a trick that isn't going right just breathe go well, it's okay we're all human it, even if it goes wrong they're not going to hate me and go through it that way and, and so by faking it and until you become it i mean you know learn to Learn to look like you know what you're talking about and very soon you probably will realise you do know what you're talking about. It can work, but you've still got to do the work up front. I don't know anybody saying, what, you're just and I should go out there. You know, you've still got to do the prep that you, you need to do. Um, and that's it, really. Uh, I think the main thing is just talking about it, understanding many, many, many of us get it. The people that look like they don't have it or the people that say they don't have it often get it more than anyone. And part of their way of dealing with it, and there might maybe, I'm sure there are people that don't get it, I'm not saying everybody gets it, but those insecurities are completely normal. And the people that say they never get insecurities probably do. And that's probably, um, and there might not be imposter syndrome, there might be other insecurities because we're human, it's just part of our makeup. And, and I think they're there for a reason, they make us kind of do the work and make sure you know we do do something we all do do exceptional things whatever our job is if we we have a profession and we do anything at a professional level and, and it doesn't have to be your job but you do it at a level that what I'm saying is that you know if you do a magic trick and people really like it that's at a professional level really because you've done something that they like they don't know how it's done it's done well enough so there's not really much difference in in the process the, the difference comes with profession is I suppose stage time and, and putting your own stuff into it but you know, by professional level, I just mean doing it well enough that people enjoy it. Um, yeah, so, uh, so uh, you know, I got, so, got, got a bit lost there. <laughs> I'm going to panic. Um, and, and just, you know, and we just need to, to, to normalise that and, and talk about it. So I hope that made sense there, because halfway through it, I got thought, what was my point? But anyway, you can let me know if, if it didn't. Uh, so I'm just going to go to comments. Um, Hey, Gid, hope you're doing, Stuart and Gary again. Um, glad you're talking about this syndrome. I suffer from it, yeah. And isn't it funny the way we say we kind of suffer from it? And, and we did, it is a kind of suffering, but again, once we know it's normal, we can just, the, you know, the really important skill to have is to understand what your thoughts are. Your thoughts are not you. They're stuff that happens, and there's some really interesting work on this. Uh, people like, actually, have I got it here? Um, Oh, no, I've got it somewhere. Uh, the Power of Now, Eckhart Tolle. Oh, uh, there it is. Eckhart Tolle. If you're not into it, it's a bit woo-woo for a lot of you, but, um, and it used to be for me, until I got older and into that sort of thing, uh, but understanding that thing of, you know, there, we are, there's, two, there's almost two of us in our heads. There, are, there is an observer of our thoughts. You know, when you think about something, if you say to, to yourself in your head, hello, it's like, well, who's hearing that? And we can see it as our thoughts are happening, but they're not us. We're something else. We can kind of observe them. And it's a really powerful thing to do because once you think like that, you almost see your thoughts as things that, if you do any mindfulness work or anything like that, they're just things that come in and they can go out again. You don't have to attach to them. And if you, you know, I'm a big um, doer, for want of a better word, 
uh, of mindfulness for that reason. You know, when I do get stressed and I can sit down and I can observe those thoughts and know that, that those things are, you know, you're not good at this, you shouldn't be doing this. It's just noise. It's just chatter. And it's not you. A um, guy called Michael Singer talks about, he, he said it's like having an annoying flatmate that just won't stop talking to you. You know, and if that did happen, you'd be like, mate, you know, but you go, we put up with it in our heads all day, every day, that inner voice just chattering away, judging things and judging ourselves. And if we can learn to acknowledge that for what it is, we can actually start to change it or just ignore it or just make friends with it. You know, it's there. OK, oh, you're here again. Are you telling me that I'm not good enough? You know, it's and, and you know, it makes it easier um, to do it if we all just talk about it and be honest about it. Uh, as a professional chef, this happens to every one of us at one point or another. It's very difficult to manage at times and makes expressing yourself and executing your visions really difficult. Absolutely, Dane. And I think that, for me, that only comes with practice. And when we have these issues, it can be so easy to quit. And we, then we've got to look at, OK, how badly do I want this? You know, if we know that those feelings aren't uh, a, a sign to quit, that they're normal again we can go okay this isn't this is i might feel like quitting but that's just part of the process we all feel like that so it's really really difficult and i think oh, tell you, i mean you're a chef you know i haven't had anybody for dinner in my house for three years because i'm convinced everything i'm going to make from is going to be so awful it's it's, it's it's like it's terrible uh so yeah we can get it in totally in everything um and again, if you let it take hold, it can definitely hold you back. If you let it take hold, Dane said, and it's that taking hold, it's attaching to it. And we all attach to any, any, all of those thoughts. And the only way to not do it is to really decide not to do it. And, you know, I've, it's mindfulness all the way for me. It's just, it's amazing. Well said and no big deal. If a surgeon fails, that'd be a different story if you fail. Learn from it, no overthinking and, and moving on. Yeah, so Fortmaster, and absolutely, and imagine how a surgeon feels, you know, there is, there is consequence, but they've still got to get into that mindset of, yes, of course it really matters, but if they attach too much to that, I can't, get, you know, so they've got to just, it's, it's like Olympic athletes. If you read the book, um, oh, where's it gone? Bounce by Matthew Saeed. Uh, there it is goes into this a lot you know this I, if you're an olympic athlete that thing of you know there's massive consequence if you win which can freak people out Can't imagine going home with a gold medal imagine your life how your life's going to change there's massive consequence to losing arguably probably not nothing actually really changes does it um and you still went to the olympics but if you attach to that thought it's going to affect your your performance so what you do is you do the work you put the effort in and when you actually get to the day you go okay and it's if you're a surgeon i'm sure you've got to do the same as we're here now this is what we do you know so we have to not relax but we have to really focus and understand and of course with repetition you get more used to being in that mindset um i remember one gig when i was a kid performing and every trick i did screwed up and in some way sometimes it just happens absolutely yeah it's and it, you know and we God, those early gigs. <laughs> I've, I've, you know, I, I, I come out of those early gigs. God, no, I did, I did all right there. And if I look back on them, they were shocking because I probably wasn't ready, you know. But, you know, I didn't charge loads of money for them. I kind of knew where I was. Uh, and it does happen. But I would, I would say again, you know, those ones where everything goes wrong are quite rare. And if they do, people will feel for you. As long as you don't panic and start, you know, blaming and go, oh, you know, um, which is rare, but you do see people do it. And just be... Um, be nice about it. I did a um, just a little story on that. I did a I did stand up for about a year. I don't know if I told this story before. And I did a comedy club called Up the Creek in London. And there's a guy called Malcolm Hardy who, who's died now. He's a f legendary comic. And his the Up the Creek Comedy Club was f uh, really famous for hecklers. People used to go and just heckle all the time. So you know it might be tough. And I was, I was a street performer, so I could kind of deal with it. I thought, and I went, I, was, well, I remember I was knackered, and I went on stage, and I'd been waiting all day to do this gig, and it, nothing was going well at all, I couldn't, just couldn't handle it, I couldn't, didn't have, my material wasn't strong enough, I wasn't good enough, and the weird thing is, there'd been three comics on before me, all open spot comics, new comics, and none of them had done well, and Malcolm Hardy had come, and he'd kind of slated them afterwards, he was, he'd, he'd kind of taken a mickey out of them, and sort of joked about how bad they were, and I was thinking, oh, and I came off, I didn't even get through the set. I got like two minutes into it and just went, do you know what? Um, I'm going to leave it now because this really isn't working out, but have a great night, whatever. 
And he came on and I was ready for the, the slamming. And he kind of said, well, ladies and gentlemen, give him a big, big, uh, big round of applause. He was all right, wasn't he? Yeah, you know. And I was like, and I realised it was just because I didn't get, I didn't get really kind of uptight about it. And just kind of, I just went, accepted what it was. And I think that can happen with magic. It's like, oh, well, you know, that didn't go well, did it? Let's try another one. Fine. You know, but if you start getting angry and I know it but it, it does happen that's where our brains can respond then people can't empathize with us and then they get awkward so it's it's going to be cool about it and and people will be way nicer than you expect uh personality can cover up any mishaps kind of what I'm saying yeah and laugh it off absolutely um I think John Bannon is extremely calm when performing and I think that helps audience management and confidence yeah he's really calm he's gone really chilled out really John Bannon it's uh yeah I, I think he's really nice to watch um, I've, got, I've got all those uh, big blind media have done the load of John Bannon ones. I really like just putting them on and he's sitting there in the gym just kind of going, hey, how you doing? And he just, yeah, looks super, super relaxed. Um, and again, mindfulness will get you there, I think. Uh, a rush magic, yeah, absolutely. Honest question, Steve. Why are most magic in 2021 releases are on the whatever side? Quarantine? Uh, I'll answer that in a second. Except Cuban Bottle, of course, which I haven't got. Ugh, but there you go. Um, I think... That, and I don't know this, this is just, um, um, and I don't know much, <laughs> quite a lot of the time. Um, but I think it's got to be part of it, right? And there have been some great things, but if you think people aren't being able to perform, so they're not going to have that, that thing in their head of going, I want to get that because I want to get that and take it to the next gig, or I want to take it to my next, next time at the pub with all my friends and show them a trick. That's what I kind of want to do at the moment, and I can't. So there's less, there's less things. For, so if you've got a really good release that you know is, People are going to want to buy because they want to show people, because that's why we buy magic, really, isn't it? Even though we love it, we want to show people, and we can't. There's going to be less motivation to do that. So I think that, of course, some stuff's going to be held back. Um, and like I said, some lovely stuff, but most of it for me has been apps, and all the Zoom stuff's been great, all the show, all the learning stuff's been lovely. And, and, um, and I think it's been really nice that people have still re released stuff and taken that risk and kind of going, well, I'll put it out anyway because I've made it. So that's been... Um, that's been good. It's given me something to do. Something too much to do sometimes. Um, and I ha I'm looking forward to getting Cuban Bowl. I will get it at some point, I think. So there you go. I hope that's helpful. That's kind of the point of it. And, um, and any questions you've got about this stuff, do let me know. And, and uh, on Monday, I'm here this Monday. Next, the Monday after that, I might be going to Devon to see my parents. So again, if don't think I'm being lazy if I, I have to not do this. So as I said, if you like and subscribe, do the bell icon. You'll know when I'm not, not going to be online. Uh, but I'd really, really appreciate your support. And, uh, uh, and I hope, like I say, I hope it's been useful. And check out cardmagiccourse.com. And I've got to say it because it's a thing that pays for it. And it's without that, there's no this really. And if you like this, you'll love that. Um, so if you go and have a look at it, I'll love you forever. Cardmagiccourse.com. Get your spread cold. Download a completely free course cardmagiccourse.com forward slash cull, C-U-L-L. -L. Um, and thank you for, for your thanks. How have you been getting on with the Mind Power deck? You're still using the I love it. Yeah, well, I get an audience. I'll be totally using it. I'll use that forever. I haven't used it for so long, though, because I'm not an audience. So I've kind of forgotten it. But I will need to get back into it. But yeah, I'll definitely use it. I think it's wonderful. Um, so have, thanks a lot, everyone. Take care. Have a great one. See you later. Make sure I press the right button. That's the one. Take care. Bye-bye.